recording. Okay, whoops. Thank you for joining. This is the February 17th webinar of Connecticut Sustenet Patient-Centered Medical Home Advisory Committee. I'm Ellen Andrews, co-chair of the committee with Dr. Tori Westbrook, and today we are hearing about how to integrate pharmacists into the medical home. We'll hear from Margie Giuliano of the Connecticut Pharmacists Association, Maria Smith of the UConn School of Pharmacy, and from Tom Buckley from both UConn and the Pharmacists Association. Um, a little housekeeping, if you are listening on the phone, remember you need to input the audio pin that should be visible on your screen if you want to be able to talk and ask questions. If you're listening on a headset directly through the computer, you don't need the audio pin. We'll be keeping everyone on mute until all the speakers are finished with their presentations and we'll have some time for questions. To ask a question, you can raise your hand by pressing that button, but to save time and be sure you don't forget them, you can also type your questions into the question pane text box on the screen at any point in the webinar. The slides and a video of this webinar will be posted online next week. Uh, Margie, you can start. Okay, thank you, Ellen. Um, I'll just tell you that I don't see the slides up here, so. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> Probably go. not good for me. <laughs> Show my screen. Here we go. Okay, good. <laughs> that's great. Thank you. I really did think it was me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, good morning to everyone, and uh, I'm Margie Giuliano, Executive Director of the Connecticut Pharmacists Association, and I want to thank uh, Ellen for asking us to present to the Medical Home Advisory Committee this morning. Um, with me this morning is Dr. Marie Smith from UConn School of Pharmacy. Dr. Smith is the de uh, department head of pharmacy practice at UConn School of Pharmacy. She's also um, a co-PI on this Medicaid uh, project that we'll be discussing later on in, in this um, program. And also, uh, Dr. Smith is co-chair of the Sustinet e-prescribing advisory committee. Tom Buckley is an assistant clinical professor at the University of Connecticut School of Pharmacy and previously was a clinical education consultant for Pfizer and a clinical pharmacist at New Britain General Hospital for many years. Tom is also um, the executive director of our pharmacist network and he is on the Sustinet Prevention Advisory Committee. So we're going to start the presentation this morning with Dr. Marie Smith. So I'll ask Ellen to move to the next slide. And Marie, you may begin. Great. Thank you, Margie. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just thought I would start out by giving you an overview of what we're going to cover in our brief presentation for you. And we're going to be dividing up the presentation. So I'll start, and then Margie will come in, and then Tom will be our cleanup batter here today. The uh, first thing I'll do is go over some of the brief summaries of some of the literature on medication use and safety in primary care, which gives us the basis on how we approach looking at the role of integrating pharmacists in the medical home. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about and show the, the um, disparate medication information sources that occur in just a normal primary care information workflow. Um, I'll spend a couple minutes talking about pharmacist education and training since I know many clinicians and many practitioners in primary care don't necessarily have day-to-day -day contact with or understand um, where um, the skill sets are and the knowledge bases for pharmacists to be involved. Um, and then we'll talk about the clinical role and what kinds of, of um, services the pharmacist can provide in a, in a medical home model. And then lastly, we'll talk about the um, approach we're taking in the Medicaid demonstration project in Connecticut, and I'll just mention that that's an ongoing project, so we aren't disclosing any results at this time. It won't be finished until uh, the end of June, and then at that point we certainly will have public information on it, and we'll take some questions and answers. Next slide, Ellen. So I wanted to start off by um, saying that um, I wanted to highlight a few of the um, a synopsis of summaries of a number, I've got about six studies here that are, um, the sources of them are listed on the next slide, but we'll go over what the snippets are, what the highlights and the takeaway points were from these studies, because I think it highlights the, um, just the challenges that exist today and the opportunities for um, improved medication management in a primary care setting. So um, the first study is, uh, is one that came out of a JAMA article that looked at 
uh, physician office, oh, I'm sorry, this is from the National Ambulatory Care Survey, um, that looked at, um, just does a set, sort of a census of uh, activity around medication use and ambulatory care office visits, and it showed that almost three-quarters of physician office visits involve medication therapy with prescriptions, and about 15% of them have four or more prescriptions. So um, we just use that as a basis to show that primary care is a very intensive medication use environment. Um, and the second one talks about um, the whole issue of even when you're using electronic medical records, that there is also a, an opportunity for discrepancies for documentation even in the electronic environment. So this one study showed that um, although they were using EMRs, about half of the meds used at home um, were documented, others were not, and the discrepancies came in both the prescription area, meaning 89% of prescription meds weren't documented in the e EMR, and about 76% of OTCs and herbal. Some of that may be due to the fact that um, we need to do a better job of edu educating patients on what medication use is all about, and that just because something isn't prescription doesn't mean that it's not something that should be recalled or listed in a um, medication history. Uh, the next one looked at similar things. About in that study, 30% of patients taking meds, prescription meds, and 48% taking OTCs or herbal uh, had their actual meds that were not recorded in an EHR. Next slide. And so that's kind of what happens, but the, you know, in a doctor's, or can happen in a, in a doctor's office, um, primary care office. However, we want to look also at some of the numbers, which are really very revealing, around um, what happens when some of these things may progress to adverse events. So you can see that in the United States, roughly about 175,000 visits per year to emergency rooms or emergency departments with elderly patients um, are related to adverse drug events. About 32% of the adverse events uh, lead to hospital admission, um, leading to hospital admission are attributed to some type of medication-related problem. And uh, the last point I included there was one that is very uh, much a topical issue today around the whole issue of care transitions. And medication misadventures, I guess if you want to call them, are, are really um, at the crux of many of the um, hospital readmissions or transitions in care discrepancies. So you can see about half of the patients with unexplained discrepancies between home and, medic and hospital discharge. That's coming out of the hospital. And then looking at people who have been recently discharged and, and what happens in the 30 days post-discharge, um, there were discrepancies in about 29% of the patients who had you know, unexplained discrepancies around that period of time. And as you know, Many of the payers are now looking at this whole 30-day or even 14-day post-discharge readmissions and looking at the whole issue of should we be paying for these or is this a quality issue of care. Next slide. Uh -huh. All right, sorry. So, that, so I guess the summary of all this is that primary care does offer a number of opportunities for interdisciplinary collaboration for uh, improvement in medication use, especially in the areas of safety, efficacy, and using more evidence-based um, tools to help us with medication use in primary care. So I, I use this slide often to show the flow of information sources, um, medication information in, in primary care. So you see at the center the bullseye, you see that there's patient and medication discussions going on in either the doctor's office, primary care office, or at the pharmacy. And uh, certainly when those discussions start in the physician's office, they, if you go up to 12 o'clock, it starts with a prescribing process and then uh, goes to the pharmacy for the processing of that prescription. Then there's the whole um, area of what happens when the patient goes home. Are they using medications as intended? And then there's a monitoring and outcomes um, uh, approach to medication use, and then that cycles back to usually some changes or new meds being prescribed. So with that as kind of the process, what I usually look at is what are these fragmented sources of information, and all I want you to take away from this, and Ellen, you can keep advancing, is that the, um, there are so many different disparate medication information sources that occur in this whole medication use cycle for primary care. You see that between prescribing and, and um, prescription processing, you have now uh, a flow that's auditable through 
uh, e-prescribing, but remember that only takes into account those that what the transaction that goes on in that quadrant. The greater issue that we don't have a good handle on is what happens in the remaining parts of that. So we, we rely on patient pharmacy profiles, self-report of what happens at home, although you can see everything from brown bag sessions where patients bring things into a, um, an educational session or a senior center. Uh, we rely on family and caregivers. Sometimes we have the opportunity to do home visits, um, webcam med reviews or something that now can be done. And then there's remote monitoring and electronic medical charts. But with all that, you see that there are so many different fragmentations of where medication info re, um, resides. Next slide. Um, OK, so um, I'm sorry, go back one, Ellen, if you can. So, so the bottom line for this is with all this fragmentation around medication, um, we believe that really the, one of the benefits of health information exchanges is that there can be better coordination of those databases around um, appropriate medication use and actual medication use at home. And it will be a platform that can be shared by licensed healthcare professionals to um, access a single point to get a, a real snapshot of what's happening uh, in real time or close to real time, uh, rather than having to make numerous calls or, or guess or ask a patient who may or may not be as, as informed about all the things that we would need to know as clinicians. Next slide, Al. So I'll just mention to you, I'm not going to read this slide, but I'll just want to let you know that um, the, the education in pharmacy today is an entry-level six-year PharmD doctor of pharmacy degree. So one usually does two years of pre-pharmacy college-level work and then is admitted to a four-year uh, pharmacy professional program. Um, we spend as professionals somewhere between two to three years, depending on which school you go to, but most of them are three years in the whole area of pharmacotherapeutics. That's much more than many medical schools will focus on. Uh, we do about a year and a half of drug information, literature evaluations, a lot of problem solving seminars, case-based work. And then um, throughout the entire four years, the, patient, the student is working with uh, patient care experiences, and then the last full year, the whole last one year, is all clinically based uh, rotations for direct patient care. There also are residencies and, and fellowships that are postgraduate experiences, and there are board certified specialties in pharmacy that many people don't realize that you sit for an exam and it's a board certified specialty. Ambulatory care, which would be the relevant one for primary care practitioners, was just acknowledged as a specialty this past year. And the expertise areas that we have you see are listed on the right. Um, drug information, pharmacotherapy, pharmacokinetics, which is the science of how drugs are um, absorbed and metabolized and excreted in the body. Um, pharmacovigilance, which really looks at the whole area of drug toxicity and adverse events. Medication safety, medication therapy management, which is an approach that you'll hear a little bit about later in our presentation. Um, Pharmacoadherence, which looks at um, not only compliance of how the patient's taking their drug as it intended, but persistence, which is the whole um, area of looking at over time whether a patient who's supposed to be on chronic meds is actually taking them or they've got gaps in therapy. And then lastly, looking at pharmacoeconomics and outcomes research for looking at the most cost-effective therapy. So with that, I will turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you, Marie. Um, so as Marie stated, the education that pharmacists receive um, really do qualify them as the medication experts. And um, you know, pharmacists do have a critical role in the healthcare system and we believe can be very easily integrated in, into the medical home concept. Um, you know, medication safety really is a huge issue and uh, quality improvement and outcomes um, are a goal for healthcare reform. So we believe that pharmacists can really be positioned to work with the primary care providers and other health care partners to improve best practices and, and create um, a safer, safer environment for patients. So pharmacists in a primary care setting, um, you know, can really do uh, perform some comprehensive medication therapy reviews. And when we talk about comprehensive med reviews, we're not only looking at just claims data, Again, pharmacists will look at, um, in a primary care setting, can look at the 
patient's medical record. They can interview the patient to find out what other medications the patient might be taking, such as the OTCs, herbals, vitamins, et cetera. And, and those really do help to create a full picture um, of a medication profile. Um, pharmacists also um, do medication reconciliation. And as Marie uh, mentioned earlier, you know, the number of adverse events and hospitalizations caused by um, improper medication use, I think when with uh, med reconciliation, pharmacist involvement can really help to, um, to uh, alleviate that, that issue. So pharmacists identify, resolve, and monitor medication-related uh, problems. Um, we optimize polypharmacy regimens. We monitor and manage chronic disease med regimens in collaboration with the primary care providers. We can design tailored um, adherence programs and health literacy programs and work with patients and payers to recommend cost-effective drug therapy regimens. You can advance. So currently, our pharmacists are involved in two projects. Um, the first is the Connecticut DSS Medicaid Transformation Project, which Tom is going to discuss in detail. But briefly, our pharmacists meet with Medicaid patients in a primary care provider office, um, and they have access to the patient's um, electronic health record as well. And they look for medication discrepancies, and again, they identify uh, resolve and monitor drug therapy problems, and they also monitor adherence trends in these patients. A second project that we are uh, involved with is working with an elderly Cambodian American population to optimize their medication use. What's unique about this project is that our pharmacists are going to be working directly with community health workers. So this will help us to overcome some of the cultural and linguistic barriers with this population. So we're going to be providing a similar service that will be discussed in the Medicaid project, um, but we'll have the community health workers to help us. And we're going to be looking at um, 100 patients. 50 patients will be in um, Connecticut and Western Mass, and another 50 um, will be in California, and we will be working with the patient and the community health worker via telemedicine. So this is going to be a very uh, unique project, and we're excited about this. Next slide. So what exactly is medication therapy management? Um, you know, this is, this is very, MPM is a, defines a very broad scope of services. So, um, you know, what, what's been agreed upon by all of pharmacy is that each of these medication therapy management services will begin with a core set of elements. So any service that a pharmacist might be providing, um, be it working with a patient uh, directly on a certain disease state like diabetes to evaluate their drug therapy, or if they're going to be providing a consult for a primary care provider, um, about pain management, the pharmacist is first going to perform, again, this comprehensive medication review, um, looking at all the medications that this patient is on. And they're going to, um, they're going to review for indication, effectiveness, safety, and adherence. And if at that point there are any drug therapy problems identified, um, they will work to resolve them. So the pharmacist creates this list of medications, and then the pharmacist works with the patient to create a medication action plan. So this really helps empower the patient and gets the patient involved with their health care. Um, and the patient really, uh, the patient and pharmacist work together to set realistic goals for the patient, but the patient is really um, held accountable to the pharmacist at their next visit. And I think, you know, Tom. Uh, we'll discuss some of that even with our, with our DSS project. We're seeing how patients really respond to getting involved in the self-management uh, process. At this point, you know, there might be some interventions or referrals um, you know, back to the primary care provider. And certainly everything we do, um, pro we do provide feedback to the primary care provider or other health care professionals that are involved with this patient. Um, the patient is given a personal medication record that they can carry with them at all times. They can share with other members of the healthcare team. 
And so they're, they leave us armed with their action plan and uh, their, pay, their medication record, and the pharmacist documents and provides follow-up as necessary. So again, um, all of this, this is what is considered the core elements of, a, of a medication therapy management, but this is, medication therapy management really defines a broad scope of services. Next slide. Um, so I want to discuss a little bit um, about PharmNetX and um, what they are. And basically, PharmNetX is a concept that CPA has been developing for approximately three or four years. Um, our organization identified a need based on the fact that healthcare and pharmacy were moving toward a patient-centric model of care. And the question was, how do you integrate this patient care utilizing our expertise into busy pharmacies? And we realized that this was a definite challenge. Um, the type um, and quality of care that we were speaking about would be difficult to incorporate at the pharmacy counter. And we also realized that the business of pharmacy would not be able to change their workflow fast enough to really provide these um, services. So we felt the best way to do this was to take the pharmacist out from behind the counter and develop a network of pharmacists to deliver the care. And these pharmacists are independent contractors for PharmNetX. Um, Ellen, you can advance. So um, what the network does is um, we negotiate contracts for the pharmacists. Um, we provide administrative and billing um, service support. We also coordinate the network of pharmacists. We make sure that they have the necessary skills for the programs that we're offering. Um, just to give you a little sense of the variety, um, our pharmacists certainly will have a different skill set when they're working um, in our program with the Medicaid grant or the Med Optimization um, project that we're dealing with versus our pharmacists that we have working on an e-prescribing um, project where they will go into primary care providers' offices and help um, look at best practices for e-prescribing. So again, very different skill sets. And so we coordinate that and uh, make sure that the pharmacists have the skill set necessary for that project. We also provide the pharmacists with a web-based documentation tool. Um, so it's, it is HIPAA compliant, but what this does is it helps to provide standardized reports. So we have a very systematic approach to all the services that we offer, and we try to provide um, a, a certain expectation um, in the standard of care that our pharmacists will, will uh, give. Uh, you can advance. So um, our pharmacists do collaborate with uh, health care providers professionals to provide this patient-centric care. And everything we do really um, is focused on improving patient care and outcomes. And you can advance again, Ellen. Pharmacists, um, again, work at the point of care with the primary care provider. They can do this service also via telemedicine. I think what's important to recognize is that pharmacists are um, really the most accessible health care professional. And so, um, you know, they can go where they need to go to provide these services for our patients. And again, um, in this service, everything is, again, focused around the core elements of medication therapy management, which is to do the comprehensive review, uh, create the personal medication record, um, develop the medication action plan with the patient, uh, document, follow up, and communicate back to the primary care provider. Um, we really feel that the pharmacists really can work with primary care providers, um, really focusing on patients who have, um, you know, who are not maintaining goal or need some work on their medication, uh, be it an adherence issue or whatever. Pharmacists can really work with um, the other healthcare partners to bring this patient to goal and to improve outcomes. Um, the next slide, please. And this um, slide really gives a, an overview of the Connecticut DSS Medicaid Transformation Grant and the other partners that are involved in this program. So as we segue into the next um, part of this program, we just thought we would provide an, an overview. Um, the purpose of the DSS grant was to build the health information exchange. 
um, and to have a real transfer of data um, into this exchange. Um, Ellen, you can, you can advance. And so there's three partners. There's, you know, uh, eHealth Connecticut, whose charge really is to build this health information exchange, um, Yukon School of Pharmacy, um, to build and evaluate the e-prescribing med info exchange, which is the project that um, our network is involved with, and EDS, who really handles um, all the Medicaid data um, information and transferring that as well, providing um, the preferred drug list to the physician's offices so when uh, they uh, start e-prescribing, they'll have that drug list in front of them. Um, you can continue to advance. And so with our piece of it, the Yukon School of Pharmacy, um, our pharmacists, again, are working on a web-enabled um, documentation tool, and they are creating this comprehensive um, active medication profile, which we have called the CAMP. And the end goal would be to be able to upload that information into the health information exchange so that other healthcare professionals will have access to a complete medication profile. Um, again, I think you can advance. And um, our, our medication therapy report, management reports are shared back to um, the physician's office. And again, if you'll advance. <laughs> and as you can see, the end goal of this is to have actual exchange um, of information from the hospitals um, and the pharmacies into this uh, health information exchange. Um, at this point, we will uh, proceed, and I will uh, turn over to Tom Buckley to talk about the Medicaid project itself. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Currently, we have uh, two uh, MTM medication therapy management projects undergoing um, that Margie mentioned. Uh, one is this Medicaid study through BSS, and the second one is working with a Cambodian American population uh, with community health workers. Both of the projects involve the same MTM process that we'll talk about, and they'll have very similar outcomes parameters that we're going to be looking at. And both of the projects have about eight or nine pharmacists working in them, and each project has about 100 patients uh, that we're looking at. So this first project which I'll review is actually going to be wrapping up um, completely in June. We'll have um, outcomes, and I believe the last patient will actually be seen, uh, last patient visit will actually be seen probably in the next um, month or two. Um, this project is a uh, been a collaboration with uh, the Department of Social Services in Connecticut, and they actually helped us uh, delineate a little bit of the criteria to get patients uh, involved in the study. We worked with them to have a download of data, uh, basically asking for all Medicaid recipients that were adults that had at least one chronic medical condition and four chronic prescription meds. And they downloaded data to us. We reviewed the data to see which patients were eligible. And uh, then we linked them to sites, and we were specifically looking at sites that had at least 12 months usage of an electronic medical record and an e-prescribing component. And we were very open to what sites we would use. We were trying to do a combination of sites, whether it was a private medical group or community health centers, and um, a, little much to, a little bit to our dismay, we couldn't find that many folks that had uh, over 12 months use of electronic medical records in ERX. So, um, but we did our best, and we think we had a, a very tight uh, project now, going with four community health centers and one private medical group. Um, the, I, I'll, I can't uh, share with you the outcomes because we won't have that complete for another few months, but I'll tell you a little bit about the, uh, the basic demographics of our uh, study. Um, the, the process, uh, just the bottom of that slide, the process uh, is that the pharmacist has an initial visit with the patient, which is roughly averaging about an hour to an hour and a half or so. And that visit's done, uh, has been done on site at the, at the community health center at the um, medical group. And then they're following up with five monthly visits, uh, roughly about a month apart. So they're seeing the patient for about six months uh, at a time. And what we're finding is that, um, as we expected, the no-show rates 
for uh, the initial visits were averaging somewhere around a 50% no-show rate. So it is a challenging population that we're dealing with, which we fully expected. But what we've been very pleased with is that the no-show rates for the follow-up visits have been less than 10%. So it's telling us that the patients are understanding the value and appreciating the value of the program. They're enjoying their visits with the pharmacists. Many of them are telling our pharmacists now that they don't want the project to end. So that's kind of a nice thing in a way that uh, we know that that connection is being made and that all of the literature shows that when that personal connection is made on a one-to-one -one basis, uh, outcomes improve, whether it's improvement from adherence to medications improving or just that person being more invested in their own health and their solutions to their health problems. We know that personal connection makes a difference. So in this uh, uh, study, our patient demographics, the age is roughly about 52 years old. Uh, the patients are averaging eight medical conditions per patient and 15 um, medications per patient. And I have to tell you, the, uh, the med range is 5 to 30 prescription meds. Our first patient had 30 prescription meds. Um, so there's quite a range of what we're seeing. Um, in terms of the types of meds we're seeing, um, it's the ones that you would expect. They link to the top diagnoses. The top diagnoses are hypertension, hyperlipidemia, GERD, depression, asthma, diabetes, the things that, uh, that we certainly expected in this population. So the frequency of meds in terms of which the most common meds we're seeing link to those conditions, antidepressants, anti-ulcer meds, antihyperlipidemia, asthma medications, antihypertensives, that type of thing. Ellen, next slide, please. So in terms of what we're trying to find um, in, uh, in, this, in the process of, um, of our reporting with patients, it basically breaks down into three separate areas, medication discrepancies, drug therapy problems, and then some cost avoidance issues and our impact on overall health care. What we've decided with a medication discrepancy report is we thought it was very important to identify those areas where the medications are coming from. One of the things we think the pharmacist can be most valuable in is building this comprehensive med profile because especially in the Medicaid population, there might be many sources of potential discrepancies of where the medications are coming from. And we wanted to have, maybe for the first time, this comprehensive profile built. So we're finding that the sources of the meds could be from the electronic medical record. It's coming from the medication, uh, the Medicaid claims that the pharmacists get as an automatic download from DSS monthly. And from patient self-reporting, they're telling us what they're, what they're on. And we're collecting everything, prescription meds, over-the-counter meds, herbal, uh, medications. So um, there's quite a few different sources of, uh, of our medications to build this comprehensive med profile. What kinds of discrepancies are we seeing? Um, we're, we're seeing things that we, we uh, predicted, although I think we're seeing them in a much bigger um, um, framework than what we expected. But the types of discrepancies can be kind of broken down into things like uh, drug discrepancy, the type of drug or the, or the actual drug itself. There might be a discrepancy in dose. The EMR says one thing, the Medicaid claim says another. The patient might be telling us a different dose. How they're taking it um, could be different. They could be discontinuing the medication, which wasn't on the medical record. Um, they could be bringing us expired meds coming from many different sources. So um, we're finding uh, a large number of discrepancies from many different for many different reasons, both from the source and the and the type of discrepancy. So these discrepancies are collected to com compile what we hope is the most comprehensive med profile possible. Um, the patient receives this medication profile or medication diary in addition to an action plan, and the action plan is specifically geared to them to make some kind of impact on on issues that may have been identified uh, in during the course of that visit. The primary care provider receives a medication therapy report. It's a fairly comprehensive report that includes the complete med profile and any drug therapy problems that were identified and recommendations on how to resolve these problems. And in fact, some of the drug therapy problems could be resolved, could be identified and resolved during the course of that pharmacist visit. Many of them are resolved with the patient themselves. Many times the patient may um, communicate with the 
identified or the resolve of a, a drug therapy problem. Um, that report to the provider is either delivered through a fax, can delivered by the patient, or um, there can be a phone connection as well um, with the pharmacist and the provider if there's an emergent uh, need that needs to be taken care of. The drug therapy problems uh, that, that are identified, um, and I think it's important to note that they're not just identified, but, but we, the purpose of this project is to have pharmacists resolve them and then monitor them from visit to visit. And so they're generally broken down into four main areas, which then have subcategories. And the pharmacists, through the medication therapy management process, look at drug therapy problems in this way. They look at things that affect the indication of the drug, the effectiveness of the drug, the safety of the drug, and then the compliance or adherence of the drug. So in the course of them looking at these four processes, the drug therapy problems are then broken down into these categories, unnecessary drug therapy, needed additional drug therapy, ineffective drug, a dose being too low or too high, an adverse drug reaction, and non-compliance. And these are standardized drug therapy problem categories Within each category, there are about anywhere from four to six subcategories uh, delineating specifically what the issues are. So for instance, um, uh, in an unnecessary drug category, that might include no medical indication for the drug. Uh, perhaps the person is using the drug for recreational use. Um, there might be a duplication of therapy or a non-drug therapy that might be more, um, more appropriate. Um, they might be taking the drug to treat an avoidable um, adverse drug reaction. So there's subcategories under each one of these drug therapy problems to get much more specific on what the issue is. And then finally, the last uh, uh, outcome parameter we're looking at is the uh, impact on healthcare costs. And we look at um, that in a number of different ways. We try to tell our providers that um, the standard for selecting healthcare savings is this. When you look at this drug therapy problem to be resolved, um, for this drug therapy problem to be resolved by someone else, without your intervention, what healthcare resources would be needed? And that's how we try to get pharmacists to look at how their impact, how their actions impact um, healthcare costs in general. So often it's helpful to use the patient's recent um, prior history of healthcare costs for the condition involved so they can look to see if there was any impact on a on a laboratory value that was saved, or a, um, a clinic visit, or an ER visit, or another physician visit. So we're trying to have pharmacists link their activities with an actual impact on avoidance of uh, healthcare costs, or potential future healthcare costs. Ellen, next slide, please. So this slide is kind of uh, summarizing what we've talked about here in terms of how to incorporate pharmacists in the patient-centered medical home model. And I think it's important to realize, and we're realizing it now over the last 10 years or so, the, the, and all of our medical professions go through these, these, a lot of people refer to them as paradigm shifts, and I think there's certainly a paradigm shift occurring in the pharmacy profession um, towards and it's been this way now for about the last 10 or 20 years, but even more so now as technology is catching up, where pharmacists now are moving away from a, from a product-centered focus to much more a clinical service-centered focus, and now the patient-centered focus of the medical home. So when we talk about that, I know a lot of providers talk about practicing at the top of their license, and, and how do pharmacists practice at the top of their license? Um, as we talked about, pharmacists collaborate with providers to do things that we're doing in these MCM studies to identify, resolve, and monitor med use, to optimize the cost effectiveness of the medications, um, to improve med compliance and, and adherence, which uh, the last figures we saw, adherence rates are, for chronic medications are about 50% or even worse, depending on the type of medication. Pharmacists can perform medication reconciliation during those times when patients will transition from a hospital setting to a long-term care or hospital to home, um, from long-term care to home. Those times when there might be some miscommunication between the hospital, the provider, and the patient. We've seen many times people moving from one setting to another setting have duplicate therapy, having multiple drugs for hyperlipidemia, for instance, and the patient not realizing 
um, that they need to only take one of those and discontinue the meds that they might have been on while they were at home. And we think that pharmacists now are, are showing their ability to um, reach out for accessibility purposes on enhancing access to care. And, and we really hope that our project with the Cambodian American community is showing that as well, because in that project, we're working with Cambodian community health workers directly with the patients um, at their site, and also with here in Connecticut, and also with Cambodian community health workers in California through a video conference telemedicine link. And the, in addition to the medication therapy management that we're doing in that project, and all of those outcome parameters that I mentioned on the last slide, what this project is doing is also allowing pharmacists and community health workers to identify the social determinants of health that are really at the, at the basis of some of these health disparities issues in that community. And we think that, that, that the pharmacist's ability to then link to the medication components and looking at all those other determinants of healthcare that affect medication delivery can really make an impact on the, uh, the lack of access to care in those populations. So um, we are trying to address those health disparity situations by working in a culturally and linguistically appropriate model. We use the community health workers to not only act as translators but also as health navigators for the patient. And we think that that's uh, we, we kind of model the community health worker in this model to the very successful Hispanic community health model um, that's happened in Hartford and other communities where we know that working closely with the person in that community improves the outcomes, the care, especially in, in chronic disease situations. So um, we think that these populations have desperate health literacy issues, and again, the community health worker and the pharmacist are addressing those uh, concerns. So um, we're excited about that project. We think it's another way that pharmacists can incorporate into that patient-centered medical home model that, uh, that national, I think it was nine national pharmacy organizations just this past year have developed a white paper outlining pharmacists, integrating the pharmacists into the um, primary care, uh, into the patient-centered medical home model. So I will stop there, and um, I think all of us can entertain questions. Um, that's okay. Well, great. I actually have a couple of questions. I'm going to start um, and take the prerogative. Um, this sounds very exciting, and I'm, I'm, I very, I agree with the the clients who are concerned that this is going to end because it sounds wonderful. I really like the patient engagement, the action plan, holding patients accountable as well for taking their medications and, and being, um, you know, responsible about that. Um, I would love to see sometime, maybe you could send us what an action plan, what the patient um, side of this really looks like so we could get a sense of what it is they're seeing, um, you know, what it is they take home to work with. Uh, also, I, this sounds as also, I'd, I'd love to know if you could tell us what your, what the response is you're getting from, how, first of all, how many Medicaid clients actually have a PCP? How many have a medical home? Who it is you're communicating with? And are you communicating with a whole host of physicians and providers or just one really? And how is this being received? Well, <laughs> do you want me to tackle that one first? Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, for the Medicaid project, the DSS project, that's a little simpler to, um, to understand because the patients are primarily being seen at a community health center or at a, a private medical group. So they do have a primary care provider at each of those sites, and our primary communication is with that PCP. So um, whether their link is through the CHC or through um, the medical group, they do have a link already set up there. And um, that is certainly easier from a communication standpoint. Um, the other project where we're working with the Cambodian population is a little bit trickier because those patients are coming from multiple sites. They could be at community health centers, but some of them are not. They were using two big clinics. One of them is a Kaiser clinic out in California. Um, but some of these are just patients who have multiple providers. And then the, I think what we're finding the value of that study is going to be is that we're going to have the community health worker work as a health navigator to take that report that we generate that we can now just give directly to the community health center PCP in the Medicaid project. We can have the community health worker and the patient go with that report to that provider. So we'll be sending the report 
if we know the PCP, in some cases we may not know one specific PCP, if we know the PCP, we'll be sending the report to them. If we don't know, then the report will go with the community health worker and the patient, and they'll hand deliver it to the PCP. And in terms of, uh, are, are providers seeing this as a helpful thing? Or, um, I mean, in some respects, you're questioning, you know, their decisions. Um, is this being well received or not so much? Well, the, I think the first, the first uh, challenge we had was, were they actually seeing the documentation? And I think that's um, something that we've overcome now, finally. And, and it's just a learning process of how to get that, uh, that flow going with information. And I think that flow of information will actually improve as the technology is being used more, because it'll be much more electronic. So that was our first challenge, was just getting the provider to actually understand that there was, A, a project going on about with the patient, and B, what was the documentation that they should be looking at. And then we've seen very positive um, communication from the provider. Uh, many times it's not, there's no communication that's needed to go back from the provider, but we see evidence of changes being made in the medical record as a result of uh, recommendations being done, or the patient has made changes in what they've done. Very cool. So yes, I think... And I think this project is similar to other projects around the country that um, have shown very good outcomes, that there's been very good collaboration with the providers, and they've been very appreciative of the project. Oh, that's great. And this um, is Margie. I just want to interject a little bit on from the patient's perspective. Um, you know, as Tom said, um, you know, we, we, it really took us a lot of effort to get patients to actually, you know, start coming to these appointments. We had you know, close to 50% no-show rate with our initial visit. Um, and then again, less than 10% on follow-ups. But what I found quite amazing was that we actually had patients calling our office, you know, looking for the pharmacist to let them know, you know, I, I can't make my appointment, but I want to reschedule. So, I mean, they really, I think it shows that they really valued that interaction. And um, because they picked up the phone to say, you know, please, you know, uh, you know, let Lisa know I can't, I can't get to my appointment, but could you have her call me to reschedule? Um, so they, they definitely found value, and of course, you know, we'll be doing surveys, um, you know, uh, on all of that as well, just to see um, what those outcomes are. But I just thought it was, you know, interesting that they actually picked up the phone. And yeah, no, I think that's great, and I'm actually not surprised that you're finding, um, consumers who find this an incredibly useful service, especially the ones who are taking 15 medications. They don't, they don't know how to sort that all out. Um, we have a question from Judith Myers. Are you looking at outcomes with regard to health care provider prescribing behavior? It's, it's, you touched on that a little bit. Um, could you repeat on, on health care prescriber behavior? Or yeah, health care provider behavior. prescribing behavior. You yes, said that you we are looking at Yes, so we're looking at what changes are being made in terms of how do they match our recommendations. Yes, that's, that's generally how we're looking at it. We track the recommendations that are being made, and then what's the um, uh, follow-up for that recommendation. And then we look at another component that looks at the, has the condition of the patient improved as a result of the recommendation and or change that's being made. So we look at resolution as well and track that in terms of patient condition status. Uh, this is Marie. I'll, I'll add to that. I'm not sure if maybe what that question was about is um, the perspective of what, what we're doing is, is important to note. And that is, as Tom outlined, our approach is really more patient-centered and then identifying medication-related problems according to the standardized um, method that, that our profession uses. And some of that will look at, you know, prescribing appropriateness. So that's how we're going to be categorizing our results, as opposed to we, aren't, we didn't go into this looking at um, the prescribing behavior of the patient's physician, per se. So I want to make sure that, that we delineate that difference. Right. Well, I don't know. Does anyone else have any questions? You can raise your hand or, um, or put one in a box. I have one other question, and maybe this is for, actually there are a couple, um, and it's maybe follow-up. It's first, I'd, I'd love to see your study when it's finally finished, um, and we can, if it's in time, we'd love to incorporate it into our report. Um, the costs, an hour and a half monthly 
of pharmacist time sounds very expensive, so I'll be interested in the, um, the cost-benefit um, piece of this. And um, are, do you have any plans to follow up with people down the road to make sure that, you know, the, the changes that you've implemented are, um, you know, that they don't go back to 15 medications, that they're staying on track and then looking down the road if this, you know, if they're less likely to end up in the hospital? Because what you're doing now may have an effect a year from now, and you're investing the time and money now, but um, we might see the, the savings down the road. Do you have any thoughts on that? or? Uh, this is Marie. I'll take a stab at it, and then, then others may have a response as well. Um, the issue of the time intensity and the cost of that for the pharmacist visits, I think, is a very valid point. And so we are going to be looking at that. Um, we also are, will be looking at, um, you know, looking at the time that's invested. Like, for instance, the, the first visit is going to be fairly intense. So there is going to be, you know, on the average of an hour, depending if you've got 30 medications and number of drug therapy problems, it may take you an hour and a half. So that first visit we know is going to be very intensive. The follow-up visits, the other five visits, they may range from something that could be if the patient's fairly well um, oriented and moving well on their goals and is meeting goals, and those follow-up visits could even be handled by a phone call, meaning, um, you know, it's a five-minute check, check-in or ten minutes or something like that. It doesn't require coming back. What we've, what we've found so far is the, I think it's fair to say that the majority of our pharmacists have had such a complex um, group of patients that that they're working with is that, for the most part, they've done all their visits on site. And even the follow-ups are, you know, they may be 15 to 30 minutes, probably closer to 20 to 30 minutes. So we will be looking at that. Um, the second part of your question, Ellen, I've forgotten. Well, just whether you're looking down the road. Um, oh, yeah, the recurrence and all. Um, it's interesting that you bring that up because we are very concerned about that. However, as you know, for the sake of a study, you have to stop it at some point. So right. But we do communicate on a regular basis with DSS. They're aware of kind of what we're finding in global, kind of a global area, and then we'll, um, we presented to them sort of the general overview of challenges and identified issues and things like that. And we are actually in discussions with them about uh, a follow-up study that looks at this whole issue of transitions in care and things like that. So this study will end. There's no doubt that this is going to end. Um, whether we will, we have a number of recommendations that we'd like to see at the end that we will present to them for identifying which patients, t you know, how do you target patients who needs to have that intense follow-up? Probably not everyone, but if you've got a patient with, you know, if it's number of conditions or number of meds or the complexity of the meds or treatment to goal issues or adherence issues, we, we hope that we'll be able to stratify for them some idea of who who they may want to continue on to do some some targeted studies longer term. Well, great. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing any other questions, so I want to thank you. And again, this will be up online on our website uh, in a, uh, probably next week because my web person is at a web conference. But um, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.